All right, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Nick, for recording this event. Uh, see, we got a few folks on here, and it's good to see uh, uh, several, several new, I shouldn't say new faces, all, uh, but people we've seen before coming back because we have a special event going on here today. Uh, we have, this is the first official uh, uh, Char Talk. We've done the Char Talks. We're actually, uh, Faye very, uh, and Natalie, thank you very much for getting that flyer out. Uh, first official Char Talk as uh, the Minnesota Biochar Initiative. And uh, Miles, as you may be familiar, is uh, we just formed uh, MNBI a couple months ago and uh, getting this going in order to do the promotion of biochar and proper development thereof in Minnesota in the, in the upper Midwest. Uh, Miles is uh, hailing from the uh, United U.S. Biochar Initiative. And uh, uh, the, Miles, if, if you don't mind, could you just do a quick introduction of your new role and a little bit about yourself and uh, about the U.S. Biochar Initiative? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Miles. I'm actually in Portland, Oregon right now, so it's extremely early for me. So forgive me if I seem drowsy. I'm drinking coffee as quickly as I can over here. Um, and you'll also notice it's still totally dark here, which is why I only have half of my face lighted. Um, but soon I'll be on a slide deck, so that, that won't be a problem. Um, yeah, so the U.S. Biotrain Initiative is a uh, nonprofit organization in the United States that essentially advocates for an uh, the, the expansion of biochar production and use in the United States. Uh, really, our goal is to increase the amount of biochar that's used, uh, produced and used in the United States um, in, in a variety of different ways. Um, and a little bit on my background, uh, started in biochar back in 2010 at Oregon State University, uh, did some of the first research on water uptake in biochar, uh, then worked on things like potting media and stormwater filtration media. I would say that was in the sort of 2013 to 2015 era. And then I and then I transitioned into the stormwater engineering space, which is a lot of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, so became a professional engineer, primarily working in uh, stormwater green infrastructure, but used biochar and a whole bunch of projects there uh, in, in that context. Uh, I was working in the consulting space, uh, worked for a lot of different cities, municipalities, uh, industrial clients, stuff like that. Um, and then transitioned back fully into the, the biochar space with a biochar startup uh, called Mino Carbon that was about two years ago. And then transitioned into my current role at uh, USBI as the program director here at USBI uh, just a few months ago. And, and I really view my role is to sort of increase the, the impact and reach of the organization. Um, and that includes, you know, things like speaking to you all this morning. No, Miles, I appreciate you taking the time to come here. Uh, just as a, a side note here, I want to welcome Sam Dunlap from the city of Cincinnati. Uh, he is one, uh, Cincinnati is one of the other Bloomberg awardees, along with Minneapolis and Lincoln, of uh, the seven cities around the world that uh, got the grant from Bloomberg Philanthropies to make biochar for municipal purposes. So welcome, Sam. Uh, you are the, the one here. He is in uh, Cincinnati, which is in the Easter time zone. So He's probably the only one here that's been coffeeed out by now. Uh, and uh, we've got a sort of few other faces here as well uh, that uh, I'm really happy to see in uh, moving forward. But like, so we've been having regular meetings. Uh, just as an aside, I was out with Chuck Hadberg and Tom Miles uh, at the Chesapeake Bay Watershed when they were trying to hopefully announce your hire, but the, the Tom was keeping it a close hold about who it was. So very happy to finally meet you and get the, you know, get that introduction. So with that, uh, we will we see we've got still more people coming on board. Uh, but we, if you don't mind, Miles, we will kick off with your presentation. Okay, great. I'm going to try to make this work as seamlessly as possible here by doing this. Uh, let's make sure. Oh, there it is. All right. I think that's working. Everybody see it? Hey, I was watching that. What? You already know how good I fuck. Nigga, take this motherfucker. I'm not sure oh, whose microphone's on. <laughs> I muted him. 
If you're sharing <laughs> screen, I'm not seeing a screen share. Oh, oh no, that we do see the uh, screen here. Mike. Ah, it's oh. it's hiding on my monitor from. Okay, I got it. I got it. Too many right, windows. Great. Let me make sure this works. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So here we go. As I said, uh, my name is Miles, um, program director here at USBI. Um, I'll mostly be talking about biochar and stormwater management, but I'll talk a little bit about um, just sort of biochar basics and some stormwater basics too. Um, as I said, this has been a lot of my experience in, in the biochar world. Um, did a lot of basic research in biochar uh, when I was a, a grad student, but then really transitioned primarily into the stormwater space. Uh, for about eight years, I was I was working primarily in stormwater, but used biochar in a whole bunch of projects and I'll, and I'll get into those um, in this presentation. All right, so so what is biochar? I think this is a valuable slide just to sort of level set. Um, I think about biochar as granular black carbon. It's pretty similar to charcoal in, in a lot of ways, um, at least in appearance. The material itself is a lot like charcoal. Um, it's produced via a process called pyrolysis, essentially heating it without oxygen. It can also be produced uh, via gasification, where a small amount of oxygen is allowed um, to burn some of the, the, the wood and vapors to provide heat. Uh, essentially, you're aiming to heat it in the sort of 400 Celsius or more range. And that material, when it comes out, um, is resistant to decay uh, in, the, in the environment. And then clearly, there are multiple beneficial environmental applications, um, including things like storm filtration, but, but there are many more. Um, and then, so that's kind of what the material is. But then I would say biochar is both material and a concept. Uh, so the concept is that when it's produced from waste biomass, biochar can really be part of an approach to produce things like renewable biomass energy or fuels, uh, remove carbon from the atmosphere, and create valuable environmental and agricultural materials. And, and then in terms of like why should we care, um, I can tell you why I care. I, I care about biochar almost exclusively from a climate perspective and a carbon perspective. Um, so I just think about it as sort of scalable, verifiable carbon removal with co-benefits. Um, this is some um, information from the sixth IPCC assessment uh, a couple of years back. And really, you know, limiting warming to two degrees Celsius or lower requires decarbonization, but it also is going to require carbon removal. Um, the, the removal part really is for some of those hard to abate emissions, uh, things like jet fuel, um, agriculture, it's going to be extremely hard to eliminate all emissions from agriculture, particularly nitrous oxide. Um, there are a few other sectors, things like concrete production. So in those sectors are really going to be hard to abate. They, the emissions from those are going to be extremely difficult to eliminate. Um, but carbon removal also serves to help draw down some of these historic emissions that are still up there and still heating the, the atmosphere and the earth. Um, and according to this IPCC assessment and many other assessments for that matter, um, biochar is really among the most viable and scalable options. Uh, so you can see that red box on the bottom left. Uh, this, this is a bit of an older assessment, but you, know, you can see that biochar is clearly one of the lower cost alternatives. Um, for removing carbon from the atmosphere. And among those others that are low cost, things like afforestation and, and soil carbon, biochar, at least compared to those two, is, is much more durable um, than some of those other uh, more temporary carbon removals. Um, so why is biochar a carbon removal? Um, you know, I think the starting point here is to recognize that biochar, at least right now, has only ever been created from waste biomass. Nobody's cutting down trees to produce biochar. It's, it's waste wood. It's things like sawdust, um, agricultural residues, um, biosolids, things like that. And the starting point here is that the, the carbon dioxide in those materials is biogenic, which means that the plants removed that carbon from the atmosphere and converted it into living tissue. Um, and then under typical management, you know, most of that waste biomass is, is gonna naturally decompose. So that's gonna essentially convert back into CO2 um, if it's a wet pile of biomass, something like sawdust, a certain amount of that is actually going to convert into methane, which has a, a 25x or 25 times the greenhouse warming potential of CO2, somewhere between 25 and 30. Um, you can also combust the material, and, and that's, you know, in some ways a better solution. Uh, it's in other ways, it's a worse solution. You know, things like particulate emissions are an issue, but you can create some heat and power. That's like a biomass energy power plant. Um, you know, or just using it for heat. 
that of course is going to release the CO2 back to the atmosphere as well. And it will release a small amount of methane, uh, particularly if that uh, system is inefficient. So now the biochar approach is, I would say, fundamentally different. So you're working with that same starting biomass, which, as I said, is biogenic. So it was atmospheric CO2 in the past, was drawn down by a tree. Um, in this case, we're using waste material. And then you're converting that and you're, you're running that through a pyrolysis process. And what that pyrolysis process does, uh, pyrolysis is breaking by fire, the Latin for breaking by fire. So you're breaking it into vapors and um, char. So about 40% of the carbon in pyrolysis is converted into um, biochar, and about 60% of the carbon ends up as vapors. Um, in this case, I'm just showing those vapors being combusted. You know, maybe they're used to provide some heat and power, but 60% of that carbon that is going to go back to the atmosphere is CO2. Ideally, those are being sort of utilized in a beneficial way, things like heat or power or uh, biofuels. There's a, a, some growing pathways and technologies around converting that material into biofuels for things like jet fuel. Uh, but the other 40% of the carbon ends up sequestered as biochar for hundreds of thousands of years. So essentially, I, I, I think of this as sort of hacking the carbon cycle, um, right? We're, we're interfering with the natural re-release of that material to the atmosphere and instead converting it into a long-lived form of carbon. Uh, getting into, you know, sort of the characteristics of the material, um, on the physical side, biochar is a highly porous material. Uh, it can have a surface area up to 500 meters squared per gram. So that's like a, a golf ball size of material it can have 500 meters squared per gram of surface area. Uh, it's just a phenomenal uh, amount of surface area and kind of hard to wrap your head around, honestly. And, and there are really three distinct pore types, you know, starting with these external pores. So external pores are just uh, spaces between particles. So this is no different than regular soil. Regular soil has spaces between particles. A pile of biochar up on the upper right has spaces between particles. So these are what I think of as external pores. And, and the size and shape of those pores depends on the size and shape of the, of the biochar. And it also kind of depends on packing, how, how densely it's been packed into its, into its uh, container or, or location. Um, then there are macro pores. So these are inside of particles, and you can see those macro pores on the bottom right. This is um, an image I got during grad school at, at, at Oregon State University. Um, and you can see the macro pores are primarily dependent on feedstocks. So they tend, to, they tend to represent the cellular structure of the incoming feedstock. In this case, this is a piece of Douglas fir biochar. Um, and in Doug fir, at least, the, the macro pores are kind of almost, almost 100 uh, micrometer range. Um, so they're they're small, but they're they're not tiny. Um, and then when we talk about micropores, these micropores are produced at higher production temperatures. Typically, they start to proliferate in the sort of 400 to 500 Celsius range and above. And they're responsible for a lot of that surface area. And what these are really are like one to 10 nanometers wide. So we're talking about 10 to 100 water molecules in width. I mean, these are extremely small and you can imagine the sorptive forces inside of tiny spaces like that become much stronger uh, for different molecules um, including things like pollutants and again that's where the majority of the surface area is within within biochar in these tiny tiny pores mm. that you cannot see in that image by the way so now getting into chemical properties um, you know biochars are primarily stable carbon rings that resist decay uh, the technical term for these are graphene sheets. You can see that on the bottom left. So that's sort of an idealized version of what these graphene sheets look like. That's an extremely um, stable form of carbon. So they take an extremely long time uh, to be broken down by microbes. Uh, one thing I always remember, though, uh, from my advisor at OSU, he had a comment that I always like to come back to. He said, well, biochar couldn't possibly let last forever. If it lasted forever, the whole world would be black by now. You know, so it does break down slowly. Um, and as it does break down slowly, it actually adds reactivity. So a lot of the reactivity of biochar is on the edges of these sheets. And you can see that on the bottom right. So you get a lot of functionality on the edges of these graphene sheets. And that's really where a lot of the sorptive capacity uh, exists. And one of the really cool things I think about biochar is that it, um, as it uh, ages in the environment, microbes continue to work on the edges of these sheets. They're eating up little bits of carbon. They're making a little energy. It's not a whole lot, so they don't do it very fast. Uh, 
but there's sort of an increase in reactivity along the edges of these carbon sheets over time. So in some ways, if you think about it from like a pollutant removal context, if you, if you had the balance quite right, um, you could imagine a scenario where the pollutant removal, the sort of filling of these pollutant removal sites is actually balanced by a growth in the number of pollutant removal sites. Uh, so it's, it's pretty cool stuff on, on the chemical side. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, that biochar is not created equal. The properties really depend on feedstock and production conditions. These are, again, some, uh, some work that I did way back in grad school. Um, the top and bottom row are the same figures just zoomed in, and you can see the scale there. It's 100 micrometers on the top and 20 micron on, on the bottom. And then the columns are different materials. So two Douglas fir biochars at 500 to 650 and two hazelnut shell biochars at 500 and 650. You know, and so right off the bat, you can see clearly significant differences between the Douglas fir and hazelnut shell materials. Um, but you can also see some differences in the production temperatures. Uh, the Douglas fir, you know, pretty clearly shows that the walls between these pores are thinning out. Uh, maybe there's some material attrition there. More and more of that of that material is being converted into vapors. Uh, on the right, I think you can also see a, a pretty significant increase in the amount of pores. Particularly on that bottom right image, you know, you, it pretty clearly goes from a a moderately porous material to an extremely porous material. So just going to put that out there that, you know, the properties of biochar do depend on feedstock and production processes. Um, and I think there is a, quite a bit of potential for tailoring biochar Natalie. to end uses. So now getting into the storm management, um, I'll just try and go through this relatively fast, but just to make sure we're kind of on the same page, you know, really the question here is what are the goals and drivers for stormwater management? And, and I would say that the baseline here is that urbanization has created water quality and hydrology problems, you know, essentially as we have converted fields and forests into paved areas. And stormwater management very simply aims to mitigate the impacts um, from this for existing and new developments, but also for things like industry. And the way it works, at least in, in laws, is that there are mechanisms built into development and pollution prevention regulations, things like industrial like stormwater permits, storm permits um, municipal, um, municipal development, development permits. permits. Getting some feedback. Can everybody um, mute themselves? That might work better. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so starting with stormwater quality, uh, I would say the baseline here is that storm stormwater pollutants are ubiquitous. Um, there's pollution almost everywhere you look in the urban environment. Uh, total suspended solids, that's kind of considered to be one of the master pollutants. That's from everything from car brakes and tires, construction sites, industry, just regular dust. Uh, it impacts water clarity. It settles to the bottom of water bodies and makes it hard for aquatic life to reproduce and survive on the bottom of rivers and lakes. Uh, and then there's nutrient pollution, nitrogen and phosphorus primarily. It comes from things like car exhaust, fertilizers, um, poop on the street from pets, exposed soil. And I think you're all probably pretty aware of, of nutrient pollution, creating eutrophication in dead zones. Um, I know almost every summer in Portland, we get a small um, harmful algae bloom on the Willamette River. Uh, then there are things like heavy metals. This is where I've done a lot of my work, things like copper and zinc. That comes from car brakes. Car brakes literally um, are have a significant amount of copper in them. Tires have zinc in them. Galvanized metals are is a zinc coating. And then there's a bunch of different herbicides. Actually, moss killer. If anybody uses like a moss off product on their rooftop, that's pretty much um, a zinc poison that you're just like poisoning moss with this zinc powder. Um, and you know, for good reason, it's directly toxic to, to organisms, including aquatic organisms. So when, so when zinc and copper are getting into rivers and lakes, they're, they're directly toxic to aquatic life. And then of course, human pathogens, particularly E. coli is when we talk about, um, that's from pets and birds. It's also uh, from things like misconnected sewers. Uh, I've heard of some studies showing that there's a decent number of houses where the um, sanitary line was misconnected to the stormwater line, uh, meaning that flushing the toilet is going into rivers. Um, oils and grease, they're pretty common, particularly from cars, but also things like uh, restaurants. And then there's this whole big category of trace organics, things like PCBs, PAHs, PFAS, which is kind of the, the new forever chemical. Um, and these have a lot of different sources and I would say a range of toxicity. 
And then in terms of, of hydrology, uh, the big term in stormwater is urban hydro modification. So essentially, we've converted all of these pervious services, things like fields and farms, uh, forests, into paved services. Um, and so the upper right is kind of a classic figure of in the pre-development in the blue, you know, when it, when it rains really hard, that rainfall, some of it goes in the river right away, but a lot of it's kind of percolate into the soil and then go into the river. Um, a decent amount of it will infiltrate. So you end up with um, a delayed peak of runoff and not a very high runoff intensity and also a relatively small total runoff volume because there's a decent amount that's going to groundwater recharge. Once we've uh, paved these surfaces, of course, uh, the runoff happens much faster, much more of the water that falls runs off, um, and much less of that water gets into groundwater. So essentially, we've increased urban flooding, uh, we've created hydro modification of streams, and, th and that term really is every stream has essentially evolved or formed in response to its flow regime. And so as we've increased the intensity of rainfall, of runoff events, those streams are being really battered pretty badly. Um, erosion is pretty significant in urban streams. So that's kind of what that term often, often means is hydro modification of stream networks uh, due to urbanization. And then finally, there's things like reduced groundwater recharge. Um, so now getting into stormwater management systems. So how do we actually manage stormwater? Um, in the stormwater space, like in many other spaces, unfortunately, people call them best management practices. Uh, so they get called stormwater BMPs. Um, I don't love the term, but it's the one that most people are familiar with. Um, so I'll just start with source control. You know, that's the idea that uh, preventing pollutants from even getting into the water in the first place, it tends to be the cheapest dollar you can spend for um, stormwater pollutant mitigation. So things like street sweepers, uh, truck washes, putting signage out to make sure the community knows that um, uh, drains actually go straight to rivers and lakes. Uh, but then there's structural things. And I tend to break these out into two different groups, filtration, BMPs, and green infrastructure. So filtration are just these devices that remove pollutants, whereas green infrastructure tends to, to have a bit of a broader goal of pollutant removal, but also some of these co-benefits. Um, so for filtration BMPs, we're talking about a lot of pollutant removal in a very small footprint. Um, you know, the goal really is to remove as many pollutants in as small a space as you possibly can. Typically, you're going to try and put it underground, um, underneath your new development, uh, because then it doesn't take up any space on site. Um, you know, these are these are good devices. Um, they have a lot of pollutant removal. They have a small footprint. They're really high quality designs. They tend to be proprietary devices. Um, they can be low cost, depending on the scenario, not always. Um, but the media tends to be extremely expensive. Um, media always clogs if you're trying to filter stormwater runoff. Uh, clogging is, is part of the design uh, to remove pollutants. Um, they don't tend to have any real co-benefits, and they also don't tend to have any effect on hydro modification. So they're not sort of uh, reducing the amount of runoff or reducing the rate of runoff. Um, you know, a lot of this filtration media contains things like sand, perlite, activated carbon is, is somewhat common, and, and there's a, a real case to be made for a drop-in replacement of activated carbon in these systems using biochar instead of activated carbon, and I'll get to that in a, in a few slides. There's also things like granular ferric oxide. Uh, those are used to remove things like um, heavy metals and, and also phosphorus. And, and one thing to know is that the filtration media itself, one of the things that a lot of these companies have done in, in creating these, the reason why these systems tend to be effective is actually they spend a lot of time and effort um, carefully controlling the stormwater media that they sell. The, the particle size distribution, uh, it's, there, there's quite a bit there in terms of science and design uh, to make these systems operate effectively. And that's a, a, really a, a big part of the secret sauce here for, for these devices. Now, green infrastructure, um, pretty different approach. Um, essentially, we're talking about vegetated systems. Um, they provide pollutant removal, but they also provide um, sort of hydrology management, sort of reducing hydro modification. And they also provide other co-benefits, right? Like plants are nice in, in urban spaces. Uh, they do things other than than just remove pollutants. Um, so again, these are these are vegetative treatment systems. They harness the power of plants. Uh, typically, use sandy soil uh, to to manage hydrology and remove runoff or remove pollutants. 
So in terms of the, the, the positives, you know, obviously these actually have very solid gluten removal. Um, they also infiltrate a lot of runoff, so they can sort of reduce the that the impacts of mod hydro modification, and they have these co-benefits. Um, the the drawbacks really are they tend to be a much larger footprint than filtration systems. There can be initially some export of pollutants. I think biochar can help solve that issue, um, and then they can have some higher maintenance costs. Depends on the scenario, but again, I, I think a lot of these things are are places where biochar can really have an impact. And, and I really think about biochar in the context of stormwater management as, as a fundamentally transformative material, particularly as the price of biochar continues to decline, it starts to become cost competitive with a lot of other materials and more effective than those competitive materials. Um, so now I'll get more directly into the, the synergy here. So I've talked a little bit about biochar, talked a little bit about uh, stormwater management, and now I'm going to try and bring the pieces together uh, with some of my experience. It's primarily drawing on my experience uh, in the Pacific Northwest, where I did a lot of my consulting work, uh, mostly in Oregon and Washington. Um, so first off, biochar for pollutant removal. Um, this is something that I've been working on for, for quite a long time, um, is the potential to use biochar as a, as a lower cost, green alternative drop-in replacement for activated carbon in stormwater filtration systems. Um, you know, so when you compare the two, they're not that different, but they do have some significant differences. Um, biochar is mostly for wood, at least for filtration applications. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can make biochar, but for filtration, you need something that's relatively hard. You can't use a friable biochar that's going to fall apart and clog your own filter. Activated carbon typically is from coconut shells, but actually a lot of it is, is from coal as well, the, the feedstock. In terms of carbon effects, as I said, biochar is a carbon removal technology, whereas activated carbon is extremely carbon intensive, even when it's made from something like a coconut shell. So, so the process is that you start with a coconut shell biochar, and then you heat it to sort of 1500 Celsius in a very um, chemically intense environment, right? So this is a hugely carbon intensive product as compared to biochar, which is a, a carbon negative product. Uh, that process does increase the surface area. Activated carbon, no doubt, has a much higher surface area than biochar. It can be 1,600 meters squared per gram, which is just, I mean, 400 meters squared is, is a lot, but 1,600 meters squared is, is just an, a phenomenal amount. And then, you know, that does impart more pollutant removal ca uh, capacity to activated carbon. Now, I have an asterisk there because in the stormwater context, pretty much across the board, filters clog before the storage capacity of a filter is used up. Um, and that just happens because there's a lot of sediment, a lot of TSS uh, that moves through filters. So usually you replace filtration media in stormwater systems before that media has used up all of its pollutant removal capacity. So in some ways that increase, that, that sort of better performance in pollutant removal uh, that I've attributed to activated carbon isn't necessarily realized in a stormwater context. So functionally, there isn't really a huge difference in pollutant removal between biochar and activated carbon. Um, treatment flow rate, I would say this is a, a real issue for, for biochar. It really depends on the particle size distribution. One of the challenges I've experienced in the bio, in using biochar in stormwater in higher flow rate systems is clogging because biochar tends to be a little more friable. So you're really wanting to aim for harder materials, particularly if you're going to do any blending, which tends to uh, damage the material during the blending process. And then, of course, cost much lower for biochar. And, and I would say much lower and dropping. Um, and so the, the key stormwater question that, that I've called out here is, is can biochar just be used in common stormwater filtration devices, things like the contact um, contact stormwater, uh, forget the storm filter, or things like the equip a unit, you know, can biochar just be used as a drop-in replacement for activated carbon in those systems? So mitigating hydro modification, um, biochar can also be incorporated into green infrastructure systems. It, it improves water holding and infiltration uh, in a lot of these soil systems, right? So you can imagine a scenario where adding a whole bunch of biochar to some of these green infrastructure systems, it, it helps it improves uh, infiltration rates, but also improves water holding, particularly because a lot of these systems have very sandy soil. And I just wanna point out that we're talking a lot about stormwater here, uh, but in the soil research world, biochar amendment 
you know, most of the research in biochar is about soil systems, sort of agricultural systems, where you know thousands of studies have shown increases in plant available water, especially in sandy soil, uh, increases in uh, plant yield, so growth, which is important in these green infrastructure systems. We want healthy plants here. Um, and it also sometimes increases infiltration rates. I'd say less impact in sandy soils, at least initially, but there's a lot of longer term impacts in, in bioretention systems. Um, so the key stormwater question that I proposed here is, does biochar provide long-term improvements in water holding and infiltration rate that provide meaning, meaningful improvements to green infrastructure effectiveness? And the big question here is around maintenance. Green infrastructure systems are notoriously high maintenance systems. Um, they have a lot of work that goes into them. They have a lot of co-benefits, but, but it does require a decent amount of O&M. And so if biochar can reduce that O&M, it provides a direct savings to municipalities that are on the hook for maintaining these things. And then finally, plant health. Um, as, I, as I said in the last slide, um, a lot of studies continue to show that biochar improves plant survival and plant health in the agricultural setting. You know, the same is very likely true in the stormwater setting and maybe even more so. A lot of the research on biochar shows that um, it has the largest impact in sandy soils. And as I said, these bioretention systems, these green infrastructure systems, they're all they all use sandy soil. They need to infiltrate water. They can't use clay. So they're using sandy soil um, that is periodically inundated and then extremely dry for long periods of time. I actually think about them as plant torture facilities. Um, and you can see some pictures here where these plants have clearly been tortured. Uh, it's particularly true in in Portland, where I live, I think we have probably among the harshest environments you can imagine for green infrastructure plants. We get a solid eight months where it rains pretty frequently, and then we get about four months where it's hot and doesn't rain a drop. Uh, we got one inch of rain in the last four months. And so you can just imagine that these plants are extremely stressed. So really the key question here is, does, does biochar improve plant health enough to provide meaningful improvements and reductions in O&M costs. This is a huge cost to the city of Portland. These two pictures are, are from pretty close to where I live. And having spoken to a lot of stormwater managers at the city, it is a large cost that the city incurs every year is replanting these systems. Um, and does this improvement offset the added cost of biochar compared to you know, the $50 per cubic yard average, which is pretty typical for bioretention media today. It usually costs right around 40 to $50 a cubic yard. Uh, so biochar is actually getting pretty darn close to that price. And so the, the cost increase is getting smaller. And I think we're getting better at documenting some of the improvements here. But I think there's more work to do to try and make biochar widely adopted, which I don't actually think is that far off, particularly because the cost has fallen so much. Um, so I'll just put this slide in. You know, this is by no means meant to be a real specification, but it's kind of a, the general approach that I used when I was specifying biochar for stormwater systems. Um, in terms of feedstock, I was always looking for wood and nutshell materials, mostly because they're hard. They don't break. Um, they avoid clogging the filter itself, right? Uh, filters clog over time because they're removing pollutants from water, but you really don't want them to be clogged by, uh, by their own media. Um, production temperature, I was typically using, using sort of higher production temperature materials, uh, mostly because they have more surface area, but also some lower temperature biochars can have certain pollutants in there that would make them, I would say, less suitable for, um, for stormwater filtration, particularly uh, a class of pollutants called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. Um, I was usually aiming for ash content of less than 20%. Uh, because that ash can contain some impurities and pollutants. pH of less than 10, you know, you really don't want to have stormwater runoff um, with a really high pH. And actually, that's regulated in most states. So um, there is really a need to make sure you're not getting super alkaline biochar. And then these are guidelines that I've used in the past for uh, particle size distribution. So the percent passing numbers, um, essentially the goal is to avoid overly coarse, coarse biochar, but also um, limiting the amount of fine material because that's those fines that really migrate through the media itself and clog things. And then impurities and pollutants. I put variable here because in, in some ways it can depend on the context, the regulatory context, um, how low you have to be 
oftentimes depends on what regulation you're working within. So now I'll get into some different projects that I've been involved in um, in the past 10 years or so. Um, the first one, this first slide is a project that I was not directly involved in. This was led by an organization, by a consulting firm called Herrera Consultants there in the Puget Sound, very good firm. Um, one of my top competitors when I used to work at Geosyntec. Uh, this was a study that they led with funding from the state of Washington to, to look at reducing phosphorus export in bioretention systems in Washington state. And so the background here is that the current specification that's used in Washington state is 40% compost and 60% sand, which you know sounds like a nice place for plants to live um, because compost is nice. But compost is nice because it releases a huge amount of nutrients, right? That's a big part of why compost is effective in for things like making plants grow healthy because it re releases a whole lot of nitrogen, a whole lot of phosphorus. Um, so it's really no surprise to me, or I don't think anybody else, maybe the compost industry was surprised, but I don't think so either, um, that biochar, or sorry, that compost, when it's used in these bioretention systems, is exporting phosphorus, pretty significant amounts of phosphorus, particularly when it's young. In the first couple of years, there's a lot of export. Later on, it becomes a removal mechanism, but at least for the first few years, uh, the standard specification for bioretention media in Washington state was exporting phosphorus. So the goal here was to look at um, coming up with an alternative specification that, that reduces that, that impact. And so they started with laboratory leaching tests. You can see this really uh, fancy setup they've got here with these columns and dosing systems. Um, and in that initial testing, this was probably five or six years ago now, they had two biochar blends, uh, and I've, I've keyed those out here. And those were 70% sand, two different types of sand. Uh, one was concrete sand, and one was some special lava sand that they were sourcing from the Mount St. Helens eruption site, um, where they've been dredging sand out of local rivers for decades because it clogged them up when the, when the mountain blew up. Um, and then 20% coconut coir and 10% wood biochar. And... These plots are, are box plots. So the, the median is the horizontal line. The 25th and 75th percentile are the tops and bottoms of the boxes and the whiskers are the outliers. Um, and essentially what I've done here, uh, these are three plots for phosphorus, copper, and nitrate and nitrite. And if they're below the blue line, in this testing, they were exporting pollutants. So they put in a certain amount of water and there was more phosphorus in the exported water in, in the discharge than on the influent. And if they're above the line, they're removing pollutants. Um, and the standard blend is the furthest left in red. That's sort of the baseline blend. And then the two biochar blends are, are kind of keyed out in these orange boxes. So you can see for, for phosphorus, the standard blend is exporting a whole lot of phosphorus. Uh, the two biochar blends are among the top performers for um, the amount of phosphorus removal. So performing well for phosphorus. Uh, same is true for copper. Uh, you can see the um, standard blend. I don't know why I did that from this report, but I think it means that the spread in the data was so huge that they didn't even, it wasn't even able to make a, a box, um, which I think just means there was a huge amount of variability in the amount of copper that's being exported by the standard media. And I've seen this before, compost does tend to contain a certain amount of copper, particularly compost that is post-consumer material um, can contain a decent amount of copper in there. But again, biochar among the top performers, we're removing something like 75% of total copper right, in these two biochar blends. And then finally, um, nitrogen, nitrate, and nitrate. Um, the standard blend is not too bad. Uh, compost does not ex export a whole lot of nitrogen, exports a little bit, but not too bad. Uh, but similar, biochar is among the top performers. So this study um, really showed that biochar could be part of the solution. Um, and then there were a bunch of follow-up studies, one of which I worked on with Washington State University. And this was essentially to scale this up, to see if we could do this in the field in, in these sort of larger mesocosm research center. Um, really, we were trying to validate this using real stormwater that we collected at this site. It's a really, really cool location in Western Washington. Um, we were looking at hydrologic and water quality performance uh, for a whole host of pollutants, and we used this state-of-the-art facility. Uh, we collected samples during six storms over two years, 
Uh, and again, it was led by WSU, Washington State University researchers, and, and myself uh, while I was at Geosyntec. And I'll just show you the, um, the pollutant removal results from that work. Uh, so I've got a number of different pollutants listed here. And this is just mean removal efficiency, percent removal, which if you're a stormwater professional, you might know that percent removal is not a great metric, but I'm using it anyway. Um, so you can see the media with biochar is the left column and the standard media is the right. So the, the biochar outperformed the standard media for every pollutant, total suspended solids, dissolved copper, um, every, every pollutant. Biochar was better, and there was no export at all from any of the biochar columns. Whereas for the standard media, there was some good performance on certain pollutants, total suspended solids, zinc, uh, total copper, not too bad, but everything else was exporting pollutants. It exported dissolved copper, nitrogen, phosphorus, right? So the standard blend can be effective, but at least for the first two years of performance, it's not a great solution to water quality problems. Um, so, yeah, uh, I would say that the project impact, really, the way that I look about this is um, Washington State is moving forward on this. They're incorporating uh, an alternative bioretention media specification into their statewide handbook. Um, that current, that specification currently only applies to select water bodies that drain to freshwater lakes that have uh, eutrophication problems. But that's actually a decent amount of Western Washington. Uh, Western Washington has a whole lot of uh, of small lakes in the Puget Sound region because of uh, used to be under under glaciers. Um, and and I would say there's also momentum to include this specification more broadly in other areas of Western Washington and in Oregon and in, in California. And I'm I'm pretty certain nationwide. Though as I said, my my stormwater experience kind of ended about two years ago, and and before that time was mostly focused on the West Coast. So I don't have a whole lot of context for how this has you know spread to other parts of the country. Uh, next, I'll just kind of run through some images. You know, I'll just start of, of industrial systems, industrial green infrastructure systems. These are engineered solutions, typically for specific pollutants. And unfortunately, almost across the board, industrial sites are not interested in having anybody like me tell you where they are or who they were built for. Um, you know, industrial sites are wanting to solve the problem and have it go away. And they don't typically like to publicize themselves. So I can't actually say where these were, but they were all in Oregon and Washington. Um, so the, the top one was at a log sort yard. So log sort yards tend to have water quality problems. Essentially what they're doing is they're debarking logs, ripping logs off before they get exported to Japan, I think. Um, so they export whole logs. And this was a large system that had a biochar filter, a large green infrastructure system. This one's been in, in I think, since 2013. So it's been op you know, operational. And last I checked, uh, maybe two years ago, it's still working just fine. Uh, the one on the right is a project that I uh, led the design on. It's a, a little filtration system, bioretention system at a recycling facility in Oregon. Um, Next are two photos of some large systems that I was involved in. I did some pilot testing work on this to select filtration media, and we ended up with a biochar blend. Uh, these were fairly enormous. So there were, I think, in this whole project, it was it was multiple sites for a single client. Um, and these were like enormous filters. The one on the bottom right, the filter itself was over an acre. Uh, and it was treating something like 800 acres of, of land. Um, that project in the bottom right, I think it used 2,000 cubic yards of biochar. So it was a pretty significant amount of biochar went into that system. Uh, still operational. I think that was completed in 2021, maybe. Um, and the one on the left was a smaller system, but similar design. That one, I think, went in up, what became operational in 2020. Um, next, I'll just talk about a project that I, I also designed. This was a, at, a, at a landfill in Western Oregon where they had a whole lot of E. coli problems. Landfills are notorious for E. coli issues. Um, it's funny, when you talk to the land, when, when you talk to the regulators, they think it's from the trash and the landfill people blame the birds. Um, and I'm sure there's a little bit of truth to both. Um, it's funny, one of the most common stormwater BMPs at, at landfills is hiring a falconer to scare the pigeons away. 
Um, it's pretty effective. So this was a subsurface flow wetland for E. coli removal. Um, this was based on guidance from UNH, the University of New Hampshire. They have some very good design guidance on subsurface flow wetlands. We used a, a biochar pre-filter that was a 50-50 mix of coarse sand and coarse biochar. So that was really where the biochar came into this project. Um, and, and the goal there is there's quite a bit of data showing that biochar can remove E. coli in stormwater systems. That, that's been shown pretty well, particularly by some research groups out of Stanford. Um, but also there's some, some additional benefits. It's not just for the E. coli part. That This site also had other pollutant issues. Um, so we got 12 cubic yards. We put that on the front end. Again, a lot of these industrial sites, the, the clients, once you finish a project, so long as the problem goes away, they tend to not want to give you any data anymore. So I don't actually have any data to provide, because it, which probably means that it was working effectively. Otherwise, we probably would have heard from the client that it wasn't. Um, this is work that I did, and this is some of the first one work that I did. Um, this is a project where we um, sort of built these custom design filters. This is sort of, uh, this is serial number one here on the right. So that was an upflow filter, water comes in the bottom, uh, or sorry, goes into the top tote, and then flows upwards through the bottom system uh, through a biochar filter. So this this project really, we, we did treatability testing at, at this site, which is the Port of Port Townsend in Washington. So this is in the Puget Sound area. It's a, it's a marine port. Um, then we did pilot testing, and then we did full site implementation. So the the project itself, the site had excessive zinc in, in stormwater runoff, like huge concentrations. Um, so we started by doing lab testing. We developed a high flow rate filtration media using biochar. We were actually able to source the material from the nearby Port Townsend paper company mill. They actually had some biochar they were already producing. They had previously just been landfilling that material. So we were able to source that, that biochar, rinse it, clean it up, and then repurpose it for the adjacent uh, Port of Port Townsend, uh, the port facility. Um, and we designed this custom upflow filter design. And then we pilot tested uh, one of the filter for four storms, and we found that it performed beautifully. It, it brought copper down from 46 micrograms per liter to two, and zinc from about 5,000 to seven. Um, so we felt like we we're hitting the mark. Then we moved into developing and building 18 more filters for this site. Uh, so that was sort of helping. So we started by making sure we could solve the problem, and then we worked to go actually solve the problem at the site. It was led by Oregon State University, that, that was me when I was there, a company called Olympic Biochar and a company called Biological Carbon. Um, so the impact of this project, you know, we, we had this one site, but what I thought was really cool about this is after this project, there were two different companies that kind of took the work that we did on this project and ran with it. Um, Stormwater Biochar and Gully Washer. And both of these companies continue to use that media blend that we developed during that project and have used the filter design as well. They've, they've created, I would say, modified versions of the filter design that uh, perform better and, and, and look better. I think the one on the right in particular is, is much more attractive than my caged metal devices. Um, but, you know, this project, uh, I think this, this story continues. Hopefully these, these two companies are effective and I, and I know they continue to be uh, based on what I've, I've recently heard. So uh, just to wrap things up, where we are today, you know, I think research, laboratory research on biochar shows that it's effective for pollutant removal. Um, it's effective as a as a stormwater media component. I think there will be more research that comes out to sort of improve this. Full scale treatment projects have been successful at multiple sites, not just in the Northwest. There's other sites. I've been just speaking about the Northwest, but there's a lot of different projects across the country where biochar has been used effectively in stormwater treatment. Um, it's effective for filtration and green infrastructure, but I would say there is some, there are some monitoring needs, really understanding longevity, how long does it last, whether or not it can remove certain emerging contaminants, things like PFAS, also 6-PPD quinone, which is a, a component of tires that kills fish, um, and then doing things like assessing the long-term impacts on plant health and infiltration rates, particularly in green infrastructure. I, I mentioned this before, but green infrastructure is an amazing system, but it has very high O&M costs. So if there are ways that biochar can reduce the long-term O&M burden, that's really going to be a driver, particularly for municipalities, to 
require developers to use this material that then reduces municipal costs. Um, there are some specifications out there. I think they need to get a lot better. I hope to help on that. Um, I'd also say that by biochar material consistency, material quality and consistency and are improving and costs are coming down extremely fast. There are now some biochar producers offering biochar for in the range of $50 a cubic yard delivered. Um, that makes it cost competitive with sand. Uh, right now, concrete sand tends to sell for more than that. Uh, so, so biochar is getting to the point where it can be cost competitive with sand. It's going to be a little more expensive than compost, but it's it's getting there. I'd also say that most stormwater professionals really have limited familiarity. Uh, that's something we're working on here at USBI. But you know, a lot of this I think is going to be driven by the stormwater industry itself. You know, we continue to sort of identify and work with real champions in the industry, um, and and you know, we aim to continue to do that. Uh, in terms of future needs for stormwater management, I always try and focus on addressing the needs of the end users to increase the usage of biochar. Uh, so in the municipal space, as I said, a lot of the key biochar attributes is this fourth row down is the cost of biochar, but also the O&M burden. You know, pollutant removal is important. Infiltration rates are important. But really, for municipalities, it's the cost, because if you specify a material that's going to increase the cost for a developer, the municipalities will hear about it. Right? The developers will tell the municipalities that this is increasing the cost of housing construction. Um, but as biochar costs come down, that becomes less of an issue. And then the o &M burden. If we can show that biochar is reducing the o &M burden of uh, green infrastructure systems, there is a path forward. In the industrial space, it's much more about pollutant removal. Did it solve my problem and was it cheaper? Um, if so, biochar will be used by industrial clients left and right. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions if we have time. Miles, thank you very much. That was an amazing presentation. I got a lot out of it. And as I'm sitting here, I really kicking myself for not introducing or not uh, bringing our public works folks from the city of Minneapolis here. I want to also acknowledge we did get Nash Leaf from Lincoln as part of the other uh, bio, uh, Bloomberg grant winners, awardees. And uh, we lost Andy Erickson. I was hoping, I don't know if you're aware of Andy, uh, but uh, he had to take off. But uh, he is our uh, uh, big brain in the room as far as stormwater in Minnesota. He is a professor at the University of Minnesota. So I was very happy to see him. And I know, Ed, you know, Ed Matheson. From and uh, just just and, real quick on Andy, he, has a, he currently has a grant through Compost Research Education Foundation where he's pulling together a, a massive literature review on the export of nutrients from uh, compost in bioretention systems. Yeah, I'm familiar with Andy's work um, from my time at Geosyntech, but I've, I've never met Andy, so. Yeah, he was here earlier. I should have taken the time of, when we started to do a direct in for, uh, introduction. I thought he'd be here the, the whole time, but his time is valuable, and he, he, so he had to run. Yeah. But we have a number of other folks here as well, um, as Miles, as We've got a lot of uh, heavy hitters in the biochar field around here. Uh, Kurt's focus, I believe, is still on uh, with the University of, uh, not the University of Minnesota, but the USDA, ARS, and others. Uh, and Sebastian uh, Barons, our own Sebastian Barons, uh, is on here. And Nick had asked him if he could stay on just a little bit. But one of the th things that uh, you were presenting on was uh, on the uh, set the design of the filtration material and standards, et cetera. And uh, Sebastian has been heading up our version of uh, uh, standards and specifications for biochar. So that will be very, uh, you know, very interesting for him. We look forward to getting that out. As a favor, was, is there any chance you would be able to share your slide deck uh, for us to distribute to the group or even a PDF uh, version? Because uh, this is something I would like to get to our public works folks to get them going. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I want to um, correct a few errors that I saw while I was presenting today before I do that. But yeah, I will. I saw them as I was going. I said, oh, that is wrong. Okay. Yeah. Just <laughs> right over that. But yes, uh, happy to. But I want to I make a few edits first. Yep. No, no, no worries. And uh, with that, uh, does anybody, I know there's a lot of great con conversations going on in the chat. And <laughs> is there anybody with a question? Sam's got one. I right, have one. Say. 
Well, uh, thank you for the presentation and for organizing this, you guys. Um, I was talking with Tom Miles yesterday about this topic. Um, you know, we've got the Urban Biochar Task Force as part of uh, sort of a, a fledgling little piece of the um, USBI. And um, we were discussing the potential of incorporating biochar specifications and just information into the minimum control measures um, for MS4 permitting, um, because I think specifically for municipal biochar projects like we've got going in Cincinnati, Minneapolis, and Lincoln, um, we have the opportunity to have the city itself as a significant customer for the project. And, um, and so I knowing that there's this overarching structure in the MS4 um, permit process, uh, I think it could provide a, an opportunity for uh, to develop something that benefits municipalities across the country and could help kind of create more opportunities for these municipal biochar projects. And um, the Center for Watershed Protection is interested in doing that collaboration. So I just wanted to throw that out here um, since this is a crowd who is um, focused on that and see if there may be an opportunity to pull some folks together to kind of start teaming up on that work. I think it's a great point, Sam. And I just want to point out that I think there's a couple different ways you can do this. Um, I worked, so as you point out, a lot of this comes back to a specification manual, right? Uh, uh, which is in the building process under an MS4 permit, right? So that's part of the, a building permit. Go through an MS4 process, typically goes through a stormwater de design manual. Um, getting the specification into the stormwater design manual is essentially the hard part, I would say, um, particularly because a lot of these manuals have slow update periods. There are pathways in a lot of them, though, that allow you to use alternative media blends. Um, okay. that's the, so, so you might you know, just look into those blends and see if there's already a pathway where biochar could be used. Because if it's cheaper and more effective, I think a lot of cities would start using it under that uh, alternative blend. I know that's the case in a lot of cities in California where I've worked on the manuals. There's there's typically an alternative blend pathway. Okay, great. Um, and I'll reach out to you. Uh, maybe we can pull together some uh, a working group to kind of yeah put, put our heads together on this a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Sam. Thanks. Thank you. Ed? Miles, I was wondering if you had any current uh, measured data on PFAS capture by biochar in any form, either as part of a media or on its own in lab scale tests, just anything that would have, give some indication for us practitioners what PFAS capture could be expected. I don't. Um, I kind of transitioned out of the stormwater industry right around the time when people started recognizing PFAS as a major problem. But I do know that some people have worked on it. I haven't stayed that that up to date on that data, though. Uh, just to add to just as an aside there, our own uh, uh, Bridget Ulrich up at the Natural Resource Research Institute is looking at that issue. And uh, Brian Berry is the chemist up there as well. Uh, so I know that, that that is on their radar. I'm not sure where they're at in, in formulating that, re that research. Yeah, uh, I've known Bridget for many years and she does great work. So, yeah. Well, fantastic. I'm glad to know your, your, your players. The Natural Resource Research Institute is a member, uh, one of the founding members here of MNBI and uh, is actively participating in uh, the get, as we get our act together and figure out what we're going to be doing. Sebastian, do you have any comment on the uh, specific? Did you read and see anything in specifications that was of interest to you? Um, yeah, I took note of that. I need to um, look and compare to our current uh, recommendations for the, uh, I think what we call right now class three B, <laughs> where we where we uh, um, have our um, values for uh, the, uh, the 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 or media or, but. Uh, I, I need to run this by by Bridget as well, which is uh, which is on the list once I I completed that. So, um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll uh, took a took a note of that slide um, with the with the values. So we'll yeah put that into our considerations. And and I'll be sharing the slide deck too, so you'll have that once it's once yeah. I get it back. Yeah, so. that's that's great. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions from the from the crowd? And is uh, uh, 
Kurt still on this on the phone here? Kurt's focus. Or did he have to drop off as well? I think he had to drop off. Oh, that's too bad because he's another one that would be, I'd be curious to get his opinion. Um, you, yep. you, you and he could probably have a very good conversation. Well, um, when I was a wee grad student, I used to come off, uh, used to come across Kurt Spokus's publications all the time. Um, yeah, when I first ran into this in in uh, in Afghanistan in 2012, uh, his was one one of the first papers I wrote, and also from the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. Yep. And so he did kind of like the, the bug in me as well. But, but uh, if we don't have any so, others, uh, we do. Miles, could you just give us a little uh, marketing pitch on the upcoming event you have in Sacramento? Absolutely. Um, we're working hard on Biochar 2024. Uh, we just confirmed um, one of our keynotes and about to confirm the other. Uh, Johannes Lehman will be speaking uh, as as one of the primary keynotes, um, and then we're going to have the head of the California Department of Food and Agriculture, I believe, as the other. I think it's going to be a great event. Um, we expect it to be the largest biochar uh, conference to date in the United States, and Sacramento's pretty nice in February. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a great time of year to get out of Minnesota. <laughs> so come on down to Sacramento in mid February, February 12th to 15th. So yeah. the the USCC conference is the week before that, and I don't I don't think I'm going to be able to swing two conferences back to back weeks. Uh, can you make a case for the USBI conference over USCC? Only if you care more about biochar than compost. <laughs> well, I, I care more about getting the compost industry to accept biochar, and so you need to cover all the bases there. Um, <laughs> you got to pick sides. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I would say that there's a lot of synergies between the two. Um, you know, I think one of the angles in the compost space is composters themselves have a lot of potential to become biochar producers. They have the feedstock right on site. Um, right. So they're already in the sort of waste hauling, biomass hauling business. So they've got a lot of opportunities to produce biochar. And also there are benefits of using biochar in compost. So they, in a lot of ways, they could be a perfect partner for scaling up production of biochar at composting facilities. And and Miles, along that note, uh, we have, uh, we're working closely with MNCC here, the, with the Minnesota Compost Council. And uh, based on the uh, agreements, their MOA that you, you, you and Tom developed with uh, USCC and USBI, we're using that as a format to uh, uh, you know, show that we're gonna, we're gonna work cooperatively and collaboratively on this issue. Uh, on, on an ongoing basis, so it's uh, it's important. And uh, with Chuck, and I told, told you Nick, but Chuck Cosbeck from uh, uh, now what is waste management. Now I believe it is. They have a large uh, one of the larger uh, compost facilities in the state. Uh, Nick is uh, working on helping form M and BI get us get on our legs. He has a great background in compost as well. But uh, Chuck is an operator, and he has agreed to help as well because that we see that as an, a very important component. On the stormwater, we have Ed uh, helping represent us on the stormwater as well, and many other uh, people. We're trying to get key players in here. So uh, with that, are there any other questions? Um, next month, Sebastian has agreed to do a presentation. Uh, Faye just got us this, uh, the draft poster. We got to run it by, uh, I, I stole your picture off the internet, Sebastian. Um, wasn't creeping on your site. But uh, we're going to be, he's on, a, but this is going to be October 20th is the date that works. So we're going to be getting that out, get it out to your networks. Uh, Miles, if you don't mind, uh, uh, that's another one. We will send it your way. If you got your, your blast, we're trying to get the MNBI running as a, as a uh, get, kick it, starting this industry in a safe and effective way in the upper Midwest. And then in uh, December, Chuck Hedberg has agreed to talk to us about the application of biochar in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So which is a really a, a new up and coming large scale application in cleaning up the watershed and particularly dealing with uh, nitrates, which is their TMDL of concern. So those, that's what's coming up. If anyone had, we still have November open. Uh, I know Harry, I believe Harry Groot was on here from Dovetail. Uh, he's, we got him in the, the pocket for at some time, but I'm not sure when. If uh, November is be good, I think you're more looking at January, February for that type of thing. But if anyone has a good, uh, can find a good speaker or want to speak themselves on a program in November, please let us know. 
Miles, I appreciate the time that you took to come here. I uh, appreciate everybody here. want to be respectful of people's time and moving forward. But uh, thank you for coming. Great to see the folks here uh, every Friday at 8.15, our time, local, so at Central St Standard Time. We do have a meeting, a standard meeting of MNBI, and it's a great chance to come back and compare notes and collaborate uh, moving forward. And then once a month, we're trying to do these char talks. With that, uh, if there's nothing else, thank you again, Miles. And I will see a lot of you next Friday. Great. Thank you for having me. Have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs>